Jeff Kirshner, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Howard, thank you for having me. Yeah, so we're going to talk about your baby literati, right? Yes. Um, so if, first of all, we got to explain it's with two T's. So it's not about uh, books, but about trash. Exactly. Um, so let's let's um, jump right in with like what what made you care about litter such that you you know wanted to devote a portion of your career to it as opposed to just sort of looking at it on the ground and you know mumbling like the rest of us you know howard i'll tell you i was never an active environmentalist and i never thought that i would end up on this sort of path it's funny how your kids can sort of change your life in an instant i was working on a screenplay at the time and i was living in oakland and decided to take a break one afternoon and take my kids for a walk in the woods. And my daughter, who was four, she noticed this plastic tub of cat litter lying in a creek. And she just looked at me and said, Daddy, that doesn't go there. Like this really innocent comment. Um, but it was an eye opener. And when she said that, it reminded me of when I was a kid. I used to go to camp. And the camp director would say, quick, everybody go pick up five pieces of litter. So you get a couple hundred kids, each picking up a few pieces. And within a few minutes, we had a spotless camp. And I thought, why not apply that crowdsourced behavior to the entire planet? And that was the inspiration for starting Literati. Hmm. And what, what was it about that moment with your daughter? That, like, you know, I've had moments with my kids where they say beautiful, innocent things, or we notice that there's something wrong with the world. And I sort of file it away. Like, I'm busy, I'm doing other things, I'm, I'm rationalizing, like, you know, that's not my problem. Like, what was, it, what was it about that moment or that tub of cat litter or that part of the relationship that do you think kind of sparked it? I, you know, I think your choice of words is really appropriate. It was a spark. But what has happened is that it seems like there's been a series of sparks, there are multiple layers of the onion that have continuously um, been peeled back. And at each moment, there's sort of like this new realization. So let me explain what I mean. So she says this, that's the first spark. And what happened next was I took a photograph of a cigarette butt using Instagram. So this is back in 2012. I didn't have a rhyme or reason for, for doing it. I just took this photograph and then I took several other photographs uh, bottle cap, a soda can, a coffee cup. And I noticed two things happening to me. The first was litter suddenly became artistic. Now that's purely because of the power of Instagram. The second thing was that at the end of a week, I had 50 or 60 photos on my phone and I had picked up and properly discarded or recycled every single piece I had photographed. And I realized that I was keeping a record of the positive impact I was having on the planet. So that was sort of the next spark like, huh, that's 50, excuse me, 50 less things that somebody's going to see or some bird is going to choke on. Mm -hmm. So I started sharing what I was doing. And then a friend of mine said, you know, each of those photographs has a ton of data. So that was another spark. Whoa, what do you mean there's data? Well, there's geotags and timestamps. So we could map where all of the pieces you're photographing and picking up are. And we could look on a time scale like, are there certain times of day you're finding these things? And then I see that you've hashtag like Starbucks plastic cup or Pepsi aluminum can. Well, we could scrape all these photographs and see how many Pepsis have you picked up? How many cans? How many straws? So suddenly there was another spark around information. So that just has continued throughout the entire process. Um, but it did start with that one comment. Gotcha. So I know, you know, a bunch of people who have become very active in the litter removal world. Um, I'm an ultra runner and there's a lot of runners who end up running really slowly because we can't stop ourselves from picking up every piece of crap we see on the ground. I saw an article in today um, about plogging, which apparently is like jogging and picking up litter at the same time. And nobody else I know ever thought, hey, this could this could be something that supports me, right? For everybody else, like I know a guy in, he's in, in Chapel Hill who just like goes around with bags, bags of garbage on the back of his truck and just does big cleanups. And that's like him, um, you know, volunteering, donating his time. Um, you, had, you had a spark like 
that this could be something big enough that could actually support you? Uh, or did you? Does, did, did, that, did that arise at the beginning or was that sort of a, uh, a, a later realization? Yeah, it was definitely not there in the beginning. I did believe early on that there was an interesting potential. Well, I was just asking this question, which was, what if you could mobilize a community to clean the planet? Like, what might that look like? I was not at that point thinking about monetization, revenue targets, customers, distribution channels, none of the typical questions you might ask when building a business. It was, this is a global problem. I saw what we were able to accomplish on a small scale at a summer camp. What would that look like at a much, much larger level? And now what if you could use technology to really start to understand at the granular level what the root cause of this problem was. That was what was a very intriguing thought to me. It wasn't until later on that I thought, okay, if I am going to devote my time and if I am going to find others who want to devote their time, how do we make this sustainable? Hmm. Yeah, because one of the things like when I first looked at the app and we were talking a little bit um, like you had a, a TEDx talk and as I started watching it so there's this there's this really cynical part of me that like whenever I see somebody doing good there's a part of my brain that wants to like bring them down and say well this isn't like it's you know I'm not I'm not proud of it but it, it's there and you know it's got its uses and like my thought was this is kind of like putting the problem of litter on my doorstep when I didn't cause it. Like the problem is really, it's not individuals necessarily, but it's a culture that produces this much crap that is, you know, disposable. And it's like, you know, so we're like an army of individuals following your app. And yet the polluters or the people who create all this stuff, like we're almost doing them a favor. We're, we're like there. And then in the talk itself, like within five minutes, you said something that totally shut up my critic, which is that the data can feed back to actually begin to deal with the problem at the root level. When, when did that become apparent to you? That became apparent to me um, relatively early on in a very interesting way. There was a school that is located in a small town called Modesto, California. And they had used Literati to pick up 1,247 pieces just on their schoolyard. And they learned from the data that the most common type of litter were the plastic straw wrappers from their own cafeteria. Mm. So they went to their principal and just said, why are we even buying straws? And they stopped. So that to me was sort of a, another you know, spark of not only is there data, but when you look at the data, it can lead to influential decision making in this case purchasing policy at a school and so now you started to think well if it could lead to that what else could the data be informative for could it help inform policy could it help influence smarter more sustainable packaging could it help inspire personal responsibility and i think one of the biggest challenges that many environmental um, initiative spaces, everybody's pointing a finger at everybody else. And it's easy to be the skeptic and it's easy to point the finger. I think it can be a little bit challenging to say, look, we're not here to blame anybody. We are here to hold individuals, organizations, municipalities accountable. But at the end of the day, we're all in this together. So how do we work together in a collaborative nature? Hmm. So let's, I want to step back for a moment. And I, realize we, I haven't done the, the marketing thing of saying, like, why is litter a problem? So, you know, if I walk down my road in beautiful rural Pittsburgh and I see a beer can or, a, you know, a straw or somebody threw out their fast food clamshell, like it's ugly, but it's, it doesn't like it seems like aesthetically unpleasing. What's the what's the like the big issue around litter? Like, why should we really care other than 
it's not as nice as not litter. There's a, a long list of, of really um, negative impacts that um, litter causes. So let's just start with the economy. The economic impact of litter and waste in general is massive to, to get specific. The city of Philadelphia spends $48 million a year just cleaning up. Really? Most of that money, by the way, is spent reactively, meaning the streets are dirty, let's put more resources out. Very little of it is spent proactively, in other words, to prevent it from hitting the ground in the first place. So there's a massive economic impact. Environmental. So millions of birds, fish, turtles get caught up in nets, have straws in their noses, choke on plastic. Um, there's a massive environmental hazard that litter or what we call leakage creates. Then there's things like community pride. Nobody wants to live or work or walk in a really dirty neighborhood. Then there's our own food chain. So you and I both consume about a spoonful of plastic every week. And part of that is because Plastic, when it breaks down and other um, pieces of litter, get consumed by fish. And we eat fish, those of, us, those of us that do. And now that is making it literally back into our system. So the bottle cap that ended up on the ground, that flowed through a storm drain, that ends up in the ocean, that gets broken down, that is consumed by a fish, that then gets caught, that we then eat. It's the... It's the circle of life, Simba, right? So we end up strangely eating the same bottle cap that first started on the ground. So I would say there's quite a few issues beyond the aesthetics of why this is so problematic. Wow. And one thing I realized, like I was uh, weed whacking one day and I had to go back, I had to go in and change the, the cord. Like, you know, it was too small. And it suddenly occurred to me, like at the age of 52, that the plastic wasn't disappearing. Right? It was it was actually going some into my yard, into the, the garden. And like I'm a vegan, so I don't eat the fish, but I suspect I'm still eating a lot of plastic. Right. Like the microplastics are somehow I don't I don't exactly know how, but they're somehow being uptaken by by something. Yeah, the, the amount and I'm certainly not a scientist and I don't understand how these things break down. But the reality is that they do. And so it's so important to get control of everything that's leaking out into our environment and is not ending up back into the circular economy, which is, you know, the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so you started, uh, I guess it didn't start as an app. It just started as what, like an Instagram account. Exactly. It literally started as a hashtag on my own Instagram account. And then all of a sudden I had, you know, 3000 pictures of litter on my account. So I thought maybe I should create a literati Instagram account. And so I did that. And then at one point it was, we need to, um, we need to start, uh, you know, really owning our own design and distribution channel. So we made the conscious decision to go from being just an Instagram hashtag into our own application. And that was a tough decision to make at the time, but it was the right one. Why was it tough? Just the resources that were required? Some of the resources, but there was a bigger challenge, which was we had spent years communicating, hey, everybody use Instagram to clean the planet. So you had effectively built a, a behavior and incentivized behavior where we were building this community on top of Instagram. Um, so to all of a sudden say, let's shift and go download an app and by the way, it'll be a better experience and it'll have this feature that you've asked for. That was a tough, um, but another spark uh, in our evolution. Mm. And I guess in your TED talk, you talk about, was it the city of, of was it Oakland or? San Francisco. San Francisco came to you and they thought you had something far beyond what you actually had technologically, right? Was well, that I, a spark? I think the reality was they um, had, they had a problem. And the problem was they wanted to understand what percentage of litter came from cigarettes. 
long before we existed, they had put people in the streets with pencils and clipboards. And those folks walked around saying, that's a cigarette, that's not, that is, that's not. And that led to a number. And they were able to effectively create a tax um, of 20 cents per pack of cigarettes. The tobacco industry sued the city of San Francisco. And that tax- Because they claim that they're- Sorry, the, the tax was for the purpose of this is how much it costs us to clean up your cigarette butts and your cigarette wrappers and your exactly. boxes. So, That's exactly. So, so the tax um, was to withstand uh, legal scrutiny had to be commensurate with the cost. They couldn't just say, hey, whatever, 50, you know, 50 cents because we don't like you. Right. So in, in order. So, OK. So the number, the, the, the getting the numbers right, right was very important. Right. So before we were around, they had tried to go through this methodology using a pencil and a clipboard. So that's what informed the initial tax. The tobacco industry sued the city, claiming that that initial methodology wasn't precise and it wasn't provable. That's when the literati was brought in. And the reason that the city was excited to work with us is because everything we did and do is through a photograph. So there was evidence. The data had something that could, it could be backed up by. We picked up about 5,000 pieces over 32 sites, which was a statistically significant sample size. And our data was used to not only defend, but double that tax, which generates about $4 million a year for the city of San Francisco. Now, the point you brought up was what the city didn't necessarily realize. What was fascinating to, to me and somewhat funny looking back is that literally we had no technology other than my Instagram account. We didn't build, we hadn't built an app at that point. And so that was, an, that was another spark. I sort of like the theme of this conversation. Like that was another spark because it was, wow, imagine what we just did for the city of San Francisco using Instagram and just understanding cigarettes. Now, what, you, what could you do if you understood the amount of, potato chip bags and gum wrappers and soda cans and everything else that's lying out there. Now you're getting some amazing data that could really be used to shift the world. And so that was the work that uh, we did in San Francisco and some of the thinking that came out of it. Gotcha. And I, I, I really like how, you know, you talked about everyone's pointing fingers in most environmental issues. Like, honestly, when I see, when I'm walking on my road and I see a truck you know, driving by and someone throws something out the window, I get really pissed at them. Like I have a whole, like, you know, all my superiority hormones like flood through my system. And I just, you know, but the truth is like, when I look at like what's there, there, the companies that make the stuff bear some responsibility. Like, like, isn't like, I think Volkswagen is starting to make parts that can be returned Right, because they're they're sort of taking responsibility for the cradle to grave and recycling of their parts, so that if I see all these Sonic wrappers or McDonald's wrappers or or Mike's hard lemonade bottles, that I mean you wouldn't think like Mike's hard lemonade isn't the villain for making bottles, but do they have some responsibility when when thirty percent of the glass litter on my road is from them? Yeah, so you're bringing up a, a really uh, current and um, what's a good word to use for this? You're bringing up a topic that is under a lot of scrutiny and has a lot of energy and excitement around it uh, and criticism. And it's known as extended producer responsibility. And it's exactly what you said, Howard. Should the, resp should the responsibility of the end of life for this packaging be on the shoulders of the producer? Should it come, uh, should 100% of it be on the producer? Should some percentage? And in the past, several states have brought um, policies that have gotten shot down, gotten shot down. Now there's a huge surge. I think nine states are bringing this forward again in 2021, except that now they're coming at it together in a unified approach. And you can imagine that some take issue with it, and others think it's the greatest thing we can do. Um, for Literati, our position has always been, we're about the data and about transparency and about empowering people to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Do I think that 
producers need to create more sustainable packaging? Absolutely. Do I think municipalities need to create proper infrastructure and ensure that our waste cans and recycling bins are emptied uh, in a timely fashion? Absolutely. Do I think individuals have a responsibility not to throw things on the ground or to pick something up when they see something on the ground? Absolutely. We refer to it as a shared responsibility. And so it is not an easy problem to solve, but clearly the idea of extended producer responsibility is a big way forward. Mm-hmm. And there's something um, really interesting about, you know, sort of hashtagging Mike's Hard Lemonade or Starbucks or McDonald's, in, you know, that your, your app is almost like a little bit of public shaming, right? If what, there's like one company that's like constantly at the top or a few, um, you know, heavy sources that, you know, the more, the more people know about Literati and the more policymakers know about it, this, you know, like your, you know, the, the, transparency and accountability kind of converts a little bit into shame, I would think. It certainly can. Our data set, so, you know, while Literati started as nothing more than this hashtag on Instagram, now it's a iOS and Android app that's free for anybody to use, and we have a full technology stack. And let me take a step backwards. The way Literati works is really simple. You snap a photo of Literati on the ground, and that photo holds quite a bit of data, right? Back to the the, the geotag and the timestamp, but now we've integrated machine learning models or computer vision so that we look at that photograph and detect what are the objects, what are the materials, what are the brands. And we put that all into this open database that anybody can consume from or can, can contribute to. It's now over 9 million pieces growing at about 20,000 a day, which is great. And just scratching the surface of what's actually leaking out into the environment. You are right that when, and we have a list of here are the most commonly found brands. And one way of looking at it is, okay, these are the brands whose material is out there. However, it also gives those companies the opportunity, to your point, to to not be the villain, but to be the hero. So as these companies, and you know, Volkswagen doesn't have a lot of litter on the ground, but if a company like some of the ones we've talked about, a Coke, a McDonald's, a Heineken and Marlboro, if a lot of their material is, they have an opportunity to get out in front of the story and to not only understand through the data where their material is ending up, but also to work with their own communities to come together to clean up. And we've done a number of programs just like that. So what... Um... I mean, how, how, did, how does that begin, that conversation in a corporate setting where it doesn't, it, you know, McDonald's or Coke or like that doesn't seem to be a, um, a, a priority, right? They're trying to increase market share. They're trying to, you know, get into uh, school district, whatever, whatever they're trying to do. Cleaning up the litter seems like it's the sort of thing that they would only pay attention to when it's like nipping at their heels. Um, are there... Like, are you seeing corporate culture shift to, to look more at greening, at sustainability as like real issues as opposed to PR? Like how, where, where are we at with that? Yeah, and with every company, it's different. Uh, but we absolutely are seeing a shift towards that. So there are real initiatives to uh, not only reduce packaging, but also clean up the environment. I'll, I'll give you, you know, one example of a company that we're working with. So uh, Philip Morris, um, really has an ambitious goal to reduce cigarette butt litter, the plastic found in cigarette butt litter by 50%, 5-0, in about five years. And so they started using the Literati platform to map and identify where cigarette butt litter is so that they can really have a baseline measurement of the scale and size of this problem. One of the biggest challenges with waste in general that's leaking into the environment is nobody really knows how much is out there. Like, what are we really working? And so they've just started a, a very ambitious global program using Literati to, to understand them. Coca-Cola has a tremendous amount of ambition to actually recapture a lot of the plastic bottles from the beaches and playgrounds and, and parks and streets to bring back because there's economic opportunity for them to reuse that material. And they see the value, they, there's an economic value is better, but um, to reuse that material. So not easy. These are massive 
companies and to ship them takes time. Um, but there are some amazingly ambitious goals and, and, and initiatives. And there you're going to see more and more of these, I think, in the very near future. Mm. So let me see if I can break down it's like what some of the um, elements of those initiatives might be. So one, one thing I'm thinking is like, I don't, you know, and this is going to sound really snobbish, but I almost never see litter from Whole Foods, right? I don't see like 365 brand cans and things. It's like, well, because Whole Foods shoppers have a, a sort of a shared ethos, right? So we wouldn't litter. Whereas McDonald's or, or Philip Morris, you know, cigarette smokers may, won't have the, are the companies doing anything to like inculcate responsible habits in their consumers? So I'm going di- to, so I don't, I don't know the answer about whether or not these brands are, you know, inculcating certain habits within their consumers, but I'm going to disagree with you slightly about, uh, the why, if you will. So I would agree with you that it's not often that I see a Whole Foods container on the ground, although in our data set, there's plenty of them. There are certainly more McDonald's, cartons, wrappers, straws, lids, uh, and there's certainly a ton of cigarette butts. Here's the difference. When was the last time you saw somebody throw something on the ground other than a cigarette butt? or maybe the truck incident you spoke of earlier. I would argue it doesn't happen that often. You don't see people constantly throwing things on the ground. So what that tells us is that it's more than just a behavioral issue. It's an infrastructure issue as well. There are overflowing trash cans. There are waste receptacles where birds can come in and pull things out of them. Mm. And I think you have to look at this holistically. Do certain people, some people throw things on the ground? Absolutely. Do some parts of our infrastructure need to be redesigned, like a garbage truck where things might fly out of, a waste can? Absolutely. Um, But it's not a simple answer. So I don't think it's necessary. I don't think you can point to a Whole Foods shopper versus a smoker or a McDonald's shopper and make a blanket statement. Hmm. The other thing is the market penetration of McDonald's and Marlboro is a lot bigger than it is of Whole Foods. So there's a lot of things you have to take into consideration when, again, getting to the root cause of this problem. And it's not easy. Hmm. Yeah. And I guess as, as with any sort of, uh, and that's really interesting that the, the issue might be what happens after someone throws it away responsibly. Absolutely. Right. And I guess I, I you know, in terms of, um, confirmation bias of what I've like on my street, I see terrible behavior, right? I see people just emptying their ashtrays. And like, when I walk, I'll see, oh, here's 12 cigarette butts all next to each other. I don't think the person like stood here for an hour smoking, chain smoking, right? So um, that's really useful for me to hear that there's, you know, there's a bigger picture than what I'm seeing on my road. I mean, context is everything, right? So I remember sitting in a park in San Francisco one time and having this conversation um, about champagne corks. There's a particular particular park in San Francisco called Dolores Park. It's a beautiful place that I used to live right by. Um, and it attracts a ton of people. And oftentimes on Sundays, people will bring champagne into the park and, and you will find a lot of the cages and, and corks. Did somebody purposely throw something on the ground? Did they maybe in a slightly inebriated state forget that it was on the ground? Because there's so many people in the park, did it fall out of the trash can? And that's why it's on the ground. So my point is that for Literati, the data is such a critical component to understanding the why. Why did that gum wrapper, coffee can, coffee cup, straw end up where it did? Because once you understand the why, then you can start to actually solve the problem. Back to where I started about money being spent. If we're just cleaning up and cleaning up and cleaning up without ever understanding the why, we're going to be cleaning up forever. It's the data that can help inform our decisions. Let me give you an example. When you go to a doctor, if you have a pain in your chest, the doctor doesn't just say, okay, here, take this. There's a complete diagnostic that's done. What else is ailing you? How long have you had that pain? Is it a sharp pain? Is it inside? Do you feel it on the outside? they try to understand and diagnose like 
the root of the problem, which then leads to a very custom solution for you and that pain. I think we need to treat our environmental problems in much the same way. Mm. Okay. So the other, the other issue that comes to mind rather than it's just sort of the cultural norms around litter or not is like at this point in our evolution as a species technologically, why are we still producing things that can't be reused or biodegraded? Are, are, are you see, like, you know, when I see those uh, filter tips from the filters from cigarettes, like why, you know, why is it, I don't know what it is, like some sort of nylon or thing, something petroleum based, like are companies starting to move towards either natural or much more easily reclaimable materials? Yeah, so the, the, the piece you're referring to is, is cellulose acetate. And you're right, it's, it's a form of plastic. Um, the answer to your first question is, I think the reason um, we as a society are still producing all of the single-use plastics is because we're a society of consumption and convenience. And in, you know, in places like the Global South, um, it's just a lot cheaper. Right, it is uh, a lot easier for a struggling family in India to afford a single-use plastic, a single-use sachet of shampoo. They can afford that. It can help their family afford, and that's a very um, important decision for that particular family to make. And it's understandable. And we need to figure out more sustainable ways because there's not the infrastructure to be able to support that kind of waste. Um, I do believe that we're getting, the, the tides are turning. The, I think across the board, everybody is recognizing that we are not in a sustainable situation. We have to create, to your point, cradle to grave solutions and get to a completely circular economy. And we certainly have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other thing is like two, two of the stories that you started with around Philadelphia spending, was it $48 million a year on, on cleanup and the, the cigarette tax in San Francisco. Both of those are examples of externalities. Philadelphia is not in, dealing with it. San Francisco now is that, you know, that, that we think, oh, the, the throwaway package of shampoo is just cheaps, you know, just like, um, you know, a, a poor family who wants to live is going to buy, you know, potato chips and, and candy because those are the, you know, and, and McDonald's even because those are the cheapest calories, but it's because of either subsidies or externalities, like the costs of their disease is not borne by them and not borne immediately. Are there, are there ways in which uh, literati is sort of helping to rationalize the the economy so that so that the cost the full cost of dealing with the trash is built into the prices only in the sense that we are providing people with a simple yet sophisticated tool to collect data and be part of this bigger solution so the more information that can be generated on a global scale the, the literati community is now in 185 countries and the more data that can now be generated about What's leaking into the environment? What is not making its way back into a proper, you know, circular economy or landfill or recycling centers? Um, that's really where we're focused. So to the extent that our data has been leveraged for informing policy or packaging, um, you know, that's really where our focus is. And, and as a startup, you know, that's what we've really kind of decided where we need to continue to put all of our time and effort because that in itself is a massive problem to go tackle. Mm. So you mentioned as, as a startup, so um, like who pays you? What's, uh, what's, the, what's the model by which you, you know, get value back? Yeah, so it's a subscription platform where primarily corporates, corporations and cities pay us to do two things. One, mobilize their own communities whether it's the citizens of Raleigh, North Carolina, or um, uh, you know, all of Pepsi's community and customers, uh, and then to collect data. So you might say, you might see, pardon me, in a particular city that we work with, we'll come in and help them engage their citizens 
And we will also help them understand what's laying all over their streets and their sidewalks and their beaches. We might do the same thing with an employee engagement program with a particular company uh, who either wants to engage their own uh, employees or their community members. So that's who pays us. So, so when you're talking about like uh, spreading the word in a community or among employees, you, you basically have to be marketers, right? Well, what we've uh, been able to do so far is try to work with our partners to leverage their marketing muscle. You know, when you work with some of these corporations, you know, we did a global campaign with Levi's last year. Um, they have a tremendous reach and they're a phenomenal partner. And so being able to leverage their distribution muscle, their marketing channels has really been, um, been advantageous for us. The same with a city. You know, when we work with a city who really at the end of the day, the cities are the ones that feel the pain because they're paying for this. Um, being able to work with the city so that they are marketing to their citizens, uh, building their ambassadors uh, to come and use Literati, that's, that's been our approach thus far. Mm. Is there, is there a problem with, with working with cities individually in terms of like a race to the bottom? Like, you know, the people, citizens of San Francisco have to pay more for cigarettes than, than the citizens of, of LA or Santa Fe? When you say a race to the bottom, do you mean, are you asking if we work with a city in the case of like we did with San Francisco and that generates a tax on an item, is that just saying, well, if San Francisco could do it, then LA could do it, and if LA could do it, then Manila could do it, and we're just gonna kind of well, that that you know, it would seem to be much more rational if there was a U.S. tax, so that you know, cities didn't have to feel like, you know, that uh, oh, I don't want to be resentful, like I'm in San Francisco, I have to pay more, mm -hmm. you know, like people cross cross the state line to buy cheap gas or or tax free liquor, right? Is, yeah, it, I think you're bringing up like a, a larger issue, right? I mean. I lived in California where the state sales tax is a lot different than where I currently live in North Carolina. So would it be interesting if there was a flat tax across the board around these uh, for every state? Yes. That's not an area that we get involved in. Mm -hmm. So again, you're, you're, you're just providing data and transparency um, so that other people can make better decisions in their rational self-interest. You just nailed it. That is it. We are simply a platform to provide data and transparency so that decisions can be made based on information. So I have a question about, so the individual user. So, you know, my wife and I will walk up and down the street on pretty much a daily basis and pick up litter, which is sad that we have to do it in, you know, on our, our streets on such a frequent basis. But like it's in, you know, an, we'll do an hour walk, cover maybe a mile or two, come back with bags. If we were using the app, wouldn't that like do you expect us to use it every single time or like once or once a week? Because like, you know, snapping the picture would take time away from the activity. So how, how do you how do you encourage people to use it? We get asked this question all the time. So the way Literati works today is yes, you snap a photo and that's how we're able to collect that data. And my answer to you is do what makes you comfortable. If you want to take one photo on the walk, take one. If you want to take 10, take 10. We have people in our community that pick up five, six, 700 pieces a day. Now, those are the early adopters. That's sort of the heavier user profile. But what I would offer is this. Every single piece, we have this uh, internal tagline, which is every piece counts. So if you and your wife are walking down your block and you never collected any data, I would argue that you will be walking down that block for the rest of your lives cleaning up. Mm. Our hypothesis at Literati is that that's a broken system because the reality is we've been cleaning up for decades. Our failure has not been from a lack of trying. There are neighborhood litter walks, coastal cleanups, public service announcements, $1,000 street sign threatening fines, $1,000 fines, you know, on street sign. We've tried everything. Problem's not gotten any better. The two things that we've never tried, one is collecting data in a very sophisticated way, and two, connecting the community that is contributing to that greater good. So what I mean by that is, if you and your wife pick up 
a bottle cap in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. And somebody else picks up a bottle cap in Manhattan. Right now, you two don't know each other exists. So what happens is that you're left with this feeling of isolation, disconnectedness, and overwhelm. What difference would it make if I picked up that bottle cap? What Literati is starting to do is serve as this unifying connective tissue. Because now you know that you're not alone. There are hundreds of thousands of other community members all doing the same simple action for the greater good and creating this data set. And what that does is it changes that feeling of overwhelm and isolation into one of empowerment and inspiration. And that is what leads to the changes in policy and packaging and what we say and how we say personal responsibility. Mm. That's, where, that's why we think it's important to, to collect as much data as possible. And we recognize the challenge. That's great. Yeah, I just finished reading a book by a network scientist, Damon Centola, called Change. And he mm -hmm. talks about sort of the 25% of a, of a group doing something is sort of the tipping point, but it has to be networked, right? People have, if 25% if of people are doing it secretly, right, then there's no, there's no spread. There's no buzz around it. Uh, I mean, true network effects are incredibly powerful in, in lots of ways. And, and many of today's uh, technology companies look to establish network effects because it does create not only a sense of belonging and community, but what ends up happening is littler communities, sub-communities form within the broader community. And they come up with all sorts of innovative ideas of how the broader community can be improved. And so that's exactly where Literati uh, is headed. Hmm. Are you getting those ideas from the, the members and uh, the users of the app in 185 countries? Sort of like improve all the time. What's yeah, so I'll give you an example of something that happened today. Um, the Literati app is uh, currently available in um, 11 languages. And we had a community member today reach out and say that, hey, uh, part of the German translation was off and they wanted to help. So they corrected it. And that's maybe not innovative, but that was a great example of the community helping us create a better experience. On the innovative side, We've had people in our community take massive data sets, mash them up and visualize them on interesting maps or do interesting uh, videos uh, or montages from them. And so our, that's why our, one of the reasons our data is open. I think Jeff Bezos said, the smartest people in the world don't work for you. And so like if you can create this open system where the group, the community can contribute uh, in ways that you never dreamed of, I think it it does everybody a, a really wonderful service. Hmm. I'm curious since you're, um, you know, you took this idea from a little spark and you've, you've envisioned something that uh, has grown. Do you, do you look at other areas of life and say, huh, I wonder what crowdsourced data could do for that? I do um, all the time, in fact, for two reasons. One, it's a source of inspiration and ideas for me and the team. You know, how can we apply something that um, a company like Waze is doing? That's a great example of crowdsourced data. Um, how can we look at what they're doing and does something apply to what we're doing? Or um, there, are there are organizations like iNaturalist that are collecting data around, uh, you know, different animals, uh, flora and fauna, how can we look at how they're What's it called? They're called iNaturalist. iNaturalist. Yeah. Or eBird, right? Collecting data, community generated data about birds all over the world. How can we look at different elements of what they're doing? And that might be, how are they getting the word out? Or how are they verifying what some of the data that comes in is? Um, so I, I look at, at those organizations all the time for that reason, for, for ideas. The other reason is I think about what else could we apply literati to? So as you think bigger and bigger, if we were able to build a massive global community who are all focused on solving this environmental problem, what 
other environmental problems could a community potentially solve as well? And so I do look outside as much as I can. What, what have you come up with? So we haven't come up with anything yet that we feel is worth pursuing um, in terms of what other applications might be worth, you know, really worthwhile. And, you know, to be honest, this problem is big enough. And our belief is that if we can get this right, if we can really focus and nail this problem, um, then and only then will we start to look beyond. You know, when you build a bonfire, as much as I would love to build the bonfire, you don't start with the big logs. You start with like the tiniest spark, right? Here we go again with the spark. You start with kindling and a match and you slowly build the fire. Eventually you go to twigs and small branches and then medium sized logs. And then you get to the big logs. And I think before we get there, we got to get, we got to get the kindling just right. And then we'll think about how we go. Right, right. And that's true for you, but you're also, but literati can also be a sort of an example, right? You've, you've created a, a model that someone else could take another problem. Like, I, you know, like I'm thinking like maybe, you know, pollutants in water, like, you know, you, you've been in North Carolina long enough, n- enough to know that nobody knows what's in our water, what's coming out of, you know, from the Dan River, Duke Energy Ash, and from cow fields. Like, I know you can't hold your phone under the, under the water and get a reading, but like the, the model you've created of crowdsourced data um, and then a, um, you know, I, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about the machine learning and how you, how you do that. But it seems like there's, like once you start thinking that way, it's a, it's a really engaging, powerful model and what I love about it is like, and I, and I, you know, when you corrected me, when you disagreed with me about, you know, the Whole Food and McDonald's, I could, f- I could hear in myself a kind of feeling like human nature sucks. Mm-hmm. And what you're really saying is we don't suck. Our infrastructure is suboptimal. It was built without, you know, realizing that these were going to be some of the blowback effects. But if given the right incentives and the right information at the right time, people are pretty good and they'll, and we can solve these things. And I love, I'm a little ashamed that it takes me so long to get there on a regular basis, but I really love the, the inherent optimism and generosity of that model. Well, I, you know, it's interesting that you, you, you said that and, and, and I, love, I love the way you put that. I think for me personally, um, Look, a lot of people have come to us uh, and me and said, you know, you could start pointing a finger. You could really, you know, you could go after companies and you could. And the truth is, like, I just don't want to live my life. Anymore. I'm sure there's a place for that. I'm sure there's an argument that could, you know, use a lot of what Literati has built and, and you know, really try to stick it to someone. Okay, that's just not how I want. That's just not me. That's not, you know, what literati is about. We, I think we believe that there's a better way. And, and you're right. If you can empower people, I use that word all the time. If you can empower people with intrinsic or extrinsic rewards and incentives, I think they do the right thing. And our community has proven time and time and time again that amazing impact can happen when they do have those tools, but the tools have to be simple and delightful and magical and sophisticated. And that's hard, right? How do you create a very simple experience that people want to use over and over and over again? So that when you and your wife are doing your daily walk, you don't think, I don't want to take a picture of everything, but it's, I want to do this. Mm-hmm. What, are, what are those levers that we as a company need to pull and find out? from a human-centered design perspective, so that everybody feels like this is a, a, a lovely and delightful uh, way to spend part of their life. Mm. Ooh, now, now I really want to have a long conversation with you about human-centered design and, and behavioral economics and incentives, but uh, we're, uh, we're, out, we're out of time. Um, one quick question about the, the, the data science and like, how did you 
like do you just go and like put an ad in the paper for or you know for uh artificial intelligence engineers and coders or like how, how did you think about i have all this data and there's so many different ways potentially to interpret it and to classify it like and i assume you know you were a, a screenwriter in, in oakland like how did you go from that to here's here's our here's how we progress to to make sense of this data yeah I, and for the record like i can't write a line of code i know nothing about machine learning models not my area um much like everything else i think that in my experience with literati has been i know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody so specifically with the machine learning it was um we were approached way back when by uh, a Dutch individual who worked at Google. And Google was getting ready to launch a program called AutoML, which was their computer vision. Uh, and they really liked what we were doing. And so it started there. And then it was, okay, can we learn something from this group? And we built like a very prototype level uh, capability. And then it was, I was introduced to a school and the school said, hey, we have an internship program. And one of our interns is focused in this area and they would love to work with you. And then all of a sudden we had an intern. And then that led to another individual and that led to a full-time person. And now we are looking at tens of thousands of images, tens of thousands of images a day and labeling or annotating them with object material and brand. And as you can imagine, Howard, it's incredibly difficult because the images are of things in d different states of disarray and decomposition. And uh, it's, a, it's a process and a journey, but it's just been one spark after the next. I would love to, when I get my next recapture challenge, instead of finding crosswalks and buses, I would love to find, you know, point click on the litter. So we actually have thought about, we use back to the example of ways, like lo looking to other uh, applications and organizations, Recapture is something we talk about a ton. You could either inside the literati experience or elsewhere. Imagine if you could help annotate and label this massive global data set that's being used by others for good. Um, and maybe you gamify that. That's an area that we've been thinking quite a bit about. And I know we don't have time to get into it, but I'm always happy to, to continue. We think that gamification represents a really interesting opportunity to bringing literati to more and more people. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I do. I do want to continue this, um, but I'm going to respect your time right now. Just tell folks where they can find literati and where they can find the apps and get started. You can find us on all of the social channels. Uh, and our website is just literati.org. And we would love for anybody to come join the community um, I really appreciate you allowing me to share the story and, and thanks for inviting me onto your program. Oh, it's an honor. It's so, it's so great to connect with people who, who are generous, creative, innovative, proactive, and are tackling some tough stuff. Like I'm glad I am not the CEO because I would totally be tempted every day to, to shame people, right? Like that is definitely not a good fit for me. So I love that that's not who you are and that's how you're, you're moving this thing forward so positively in the world. I really want to thank you for taking the time today and for the amazing work you're doing. Thank you so much. All right. And, and one day when this uh, pandemic cools down, we'll meet in person. We're like that's probably 15 true. minutes away from each other. That's right. We're not too far from one another. Right. Oh, one last question. What, what was the summer camp? Brant Lake Camp in the Adirondacks of New York. All right, because uh, we had a litter pickup at Camp Ramah in Wingdale. I know Camp Ramah, although I think there are a few Camp Ramahs. There are. Um, yes. There are, but we, we, we um, the, the, the winning bunk got like Fryhofer's don uh, <laughs> of cookies. So <laughs> yeah. definitely extrinsic motivation. So. All right, well, thank you so much. Have a fabulous weekend, and I, I look forward to meeting you in person someday. Likewise. Take care.